Hi, this is Dan Heisman, and this is another video in our YouTube series to help you improve your chess game. Of course, since my videos are all about improving your chess game, I expect most of the people watching the videos want to get better at chess. And of course, and of course most of the videos in the series, since it's that type of series, are designed to help you do just that. And today I want to talk about the improvement feedback loop. Imagine that you're in school and the teacher does his or her lectures and you do your homework and they give you tests. But every time you ask the teacher a question, they say they're not allowed to answer. And when you come in with your homework, they don't bring you up to the, the board and have you show your homework or they don't go over your homework and they don't, when they collect your homework, they don't grade it and give it back to you. And when you take quizzes and tests, they tell you your score, but they don't give it back to you and tell you which problems they got wrong. And if you ask questions about it, they refuse to answer. Well, your whole learning process would kind of fall apart in that case. Now let's compare that to chess. Let's say you lock yourself in a closet and you study some tactics and you try to memorize some openings and then you go play someone and it doesn't work very well. And then you go back and you say, I need to study more tactics and you do and you have a problem and you say, oh my goodness, I'm not good at end games. I better buy an end game book and you read the end game book and you play. Well, are you gonna get better that way? Sure you are. But how fast and how far are you going to get better? The problem is you're leaving out that third dimension, like in school, where the teacher answers your questions, goes over the homework with you, you know, gives back your quizzes, goes over the tests. This is feedback. In chess, you want to get feedback for what you're doing. You don't want to just guess. If your only feedback is whether you win or lose, and then you have to guess, oh yes, I made that bad move there on move 23, Next time I'll try not to do that. That's a very marginal type of feedback that you can get from playing chess. But you want much better feedback. For instance, we have now videos, databases, and books about openings. So after each game, you can go back and look up your opening and say, if I had to play this game again, which move would I do better? So let's, let's do that. You know, before we talk about other types of feedback, Let's, let's see what you could do with a database. So I picked a random amateur game here from ICC, and I have no idea what the opening is going to be. I hope White doesn't play H3 on the first move, because that's not the kind of opening you're going to get feedback on and try to improve. But let's see what happens. White plays B4. Okay, so that's a pretty rare opening, so I picked a pretty bad example here. Let's see if I can make this window a little bit smaller here, so I can maneuver it a little. Okay, so B4. All right, let's say you don't have any idea what to do about B4. It's Sikolsky's opening, the Polish opening. Let's see what black plays. Black plays E5. White plays Bishop B2, attacking the pawn. Now what should black do? Should he guard the pawn, or should he just take this pawn that he's attacking on B4? Black guards the pawn, but he guards the pawn with a piece where you can do removal of the guard on the, on the pawn. So white can play b5 and remove the knights guarding the pawn. Let's see what happens. White just plays a3. White could have played b5. All right, let's see what black does. Black plays knight f6. White plays d3. Now, we, we have several ways of getting feedback here. We can use a database. We could use an engine. So let's go back and ask Stockfish. Stockfish, e5. Let's assume that's a reasonable move, and white's going to play bishop b2. What's the best way to react to this? And we'll, we'll show the top three moves here. That's why I wanted to move the window open. One, two, three. Okay, so Stockfish is already showing that Bishop takes B4, which is the move that I like to play, is the number one move. The number two move is the interesting move, Knight F6, just saying, if you take my pawn, I'll take yours. And the third move, D6, guards the pawn. Notice black's move knight to b6, not sorry, knight to c6, doesn't make the top three. So if you're black and you're doing this, next time you play, you want to look this up, give it to the engine, give it to the database. Now let's say you're white and you say, I don't know what to do when people play knight to c6. So let's go one move further. And white could look at this up. And Stockfish is saying, look, remove all the guard, you're winning already. If he pushes the pawn up here and removes the guard, let's say the only move the knight can make without losing the pawn is knight to d4, then white simply plays e3, which does two things. 
One, it guards the pawn on b5 so that knight takes b5 is not safe. And two, it stops the knight from coming back here so the knight has to remove its blockage of the e-pawn. And after the knight moves somewhere, then white can just take the pawn and he's up a pawn and he's winning. So we can see here that knight c6 is a bad mistake and that b5 is the right answer and that white would be practically winning. So both sides made mistakes in the first three moves. Black's mistake was to play knight c6 and white's mistake was to play a3 instead of b5. We could have looked this up in a database instead. Let's go over to the Explorer database over here and we'll click on b4 and we'll click on e5, number one move, bishop b2, and now we can see that knight c6 is only the number five move, and out of, out of let's say, six, seven hundred games, it was only played ten times. Well, oh, sorry, knight c6 was only played seven times, and white won 77%. So we click on knight c6, and now you see almost every game, white played b5. When black tried to play knight d4, every game white played e3, and white won 100% of the games after knight e6. Black played, white played bishop takes e5, and they give you the two games where this was played, and of course white's up a pawn for nothing, so we should be winning. So now we've gotten feedback two different ways on our openings. One way was from a database, that was the second thing we did, and the first one was from an engine. Let's talk about feedback from engines. Let's go back to our other board. Uh, let's make the board smaller again, or sorry, make the window fit the size again. Choo, 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 choo. There we go. All right, so let's talk about engines. I once had a teenager say to me, you know, I know you're a chess coach, but why would I ever want to hire you? I can just go over my game with an engine, and the engine's better than you are, so what good are you? And I said to him, well, if I can't answer that question, I guess I'm out of a job. Um, yes, when you go over the game with an engine, it gives you feedback, but it gives you very, very narrow feedback. Now, there are websites now that are trying to do better on that feedback than the, than the kind of narrow feedback you get right now. But basically, all the engine's going to do is it's going to show you whether your move was any good or not and what you could have done better in terms of your moves. But it doesn't tell you anything about your misconceptions or why you might have made that move, or whether you're playing too fast or too slow. A lot of these things are things that coaches do, and coaches can also tell you, oh, here's a good book to read that will help you, or here's a good video, or this is where you should play in the tournament, or these are the kind of people you should play, or these are the time limits you should play. A coach can do all of those things, while an engine can't do any of those things. So you could read a book on good things you can do to improve, and that's good feedback also. But the point is, you want to have, be able to go over games with strong players and get advice from good coaches on how to improve your game. This is the kind of feedback that you really need. If you're playing too slow and you're getting into unnecessary time trouble, you want a coach who can say, A, one of your biggest problems is you're playing too slow and you're getting into unnecessary time trouble. Then B, the coach is going to convince you why that's a bad thing, why you should try to stop doing it. And then finally, the coach can tell you some things you can do to help you speed up. Doesn't mean it's always going to work. After all, you can take a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. But these are a lot of things that a coach can do. And these are the kind of feedbacks that we're talking about. So let's say you realize you're not very good at the end game. <clears throat> well, maybe you could pick up an end game book and you could say, OK, I'm going to learn about things in the end game. But if you watched my video from a couple weeks ago called Exact versus Inexact Endgames, the most endgame books are not going to teach you about practical endgames. They're not going to teach you about how to play endgames in general. All they're going to do is tell you if you get into these very specific deep endgames, then here's how you should play them. And of course, if you kind of learn what they're trying to teach you in those deep endgames, you're going to play them a lot better. And I have a lot of videos on my channel here like king and pawn against king number one, king against pawn number king, sorry, king against pawn versus king number two, where I do the same thing. I take very common exact endgames and I teach you what you should do. But let's say you're bad at endgames because you don't have, know how to analyze very well. Then learning how to analyze well is a very difficult thing to do and it's something that you need to work on consistently. 
This gets back to what I talked about in one of my earlier videos, which is basically there's two ways to improve. One way is to add knowledge, and the other way is to improve your skills. And they're not mutually exclusive, they're not independent. For instance, it's a skill to evaluate a position, but as you add your knowledge of chess, your skill uses some of that knowledge to evaluate the position, and you get better and better. For instance, if you think that double pawns are absolutely horrible, and that's maybe even worse than losing a pawn is to double your pawns, then as you add more knowledge and you realize double pawns usually aren't that bad, then your evaluation skill gets better because you're better able to evaluate positions where pawns are doubled on one side or the other. <clears throat> so improving your knowledge is definitely one of the top ways to get better at chess, but it's not the only way. In fact, it's not even the major way. The major way to get better is to improve your skills, specifically your analytical skill and your evaluation skills. And the analysis skills include things like um, your ability to visualize positions when you're analyzing and looking ahead. That's like a sub-skill to analysis. And as you get better at that kind of thing, you're able to analyze better and you're able to come up with better choices. I, I did a video about a year ago called Getting Better at Chess Requires Finding Better Chess Moves. And a couple of people didn't get the kind of tongue-in-cheek idea that I was doing. They thought I was saying something stupid and redundant. But actually, there's a difference between finding better chess moves, which means being a better analyst, and knowing better chess moves, which means memorizing openings, memorizing endgames, studying tactical patterns, so that now you know in a certain position, oh, I can do this and this and this and win a pawn, while when you're analyzing better, you're in positions where you don't recognize things, or at least not entirely, <clears throat> and you're using your analytical skill to try to find better moves than what you found before. These two issues have something in common. The idea that you get better by A, adding more knowledge, learning principles, learning openings, learning endgames, recognizing patterns, versus abilities, analysis, time management, perseverance, uh, learning from, ability to tr tolerate losses, um, evaluation. These are all skills. These two things, as I said, are not independent. But the idea that you need a feedback loop and the idea that knowledge versus skills are important, these two things are not also not completely mutually exclusive and independent. So for instance, if you're learning things by knowledge, let's say you learn something, we use that example already about double pawns, that somebody tells you double pawns are bad. And you say, okay, then I'm gonna do everything I can to avoid double pawns. Let's say someone plays the Roy Lopez, e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop b5, and you say, oh no, he's threatening to take my knight and double my pawns. I guess I have to move my knight because I know that double pawns are bad. Well, if you go so far as to do stuff like that, then it's good to get feedback from someone that says, well, no, you know, double pawns may be slightly negative on the average, but if you let him take your knight and you get your pawns doubled, then you're going to get some compensations. You're going to get a semi-open file. You'll get the bishop pair. Uh, you'll get tactics that can help you save the pawn. For instance, if you play a6 and he plays bishop takes, you should take this way. This is knowledge. And if he plays knight takes e5, if you have no knowledge of this position, you might say that black has three ways to try to get back the pawn. He can play queen to g5 with a double attack on the knight and the pawn. He can play queen e7 with a skewer of the knight and the pawn or he can play queen d4 with a double attack on the knight and the pawn. All right, well, your analytical skill might tell you which one is the best. In my case, I have knowledge, so I can say, oh, I've gone over this position with engines, I've gone over with good players, and everybody agrees the best way to get the pawn back is to play queen to d4. On the other hand, let's say after knight f3, queen takes e2 check, let's say you're a weaker player here, and you say, wait, well, I only have two moves, king f1 or queen e2, Either way, I can't castle, but if I can't castle, I really like to play with my queen, so I'm going to play king f1, and at least I keep my queen on the board, and I, I have a chance in the middle game because I like playing with my queen. All right, again, you can get feedback here, and a good player can say, okay, well, if you can't castle, it's better to have the queens off the board. And not only that, if you can't castle, 
it's good to have your king in a position where your rooks can easily get in the game. So it's much better to play queen e2, even if you like to keep your queens on the board. And that way, if he does stop you from castling with queen takes e2, king takes e2, you have the better pawn structure. Black has the bishop pair, but you can just get your rook in the game and then bring your king back. Also, if you're asked to evaluate this position, if you think that double pawns are terrible, you might say, well, double pawns are terrible, so that's really bad for black. But on the other hand, white can't castle, which is really bad for white, so maybe it's about equal. Well, it turns out neither of those, I, neither of those things are very important. When you get feedback from a good player, they're going to say, oh, the real important thing that's going on here is that black has the bishop pair. He has two bishops and white doesn't, which is called the advantage of the bishop pair. The fact that white can't castle is not a big deal here. He'll just play rook to e1. And the fact that black has double pawns isn't that bad because the double pawns are on a side where white has four against four and white can't create a pass pawn into the end game. Again, feedback. So if you say, well, does that mean double pawns are always not that bad? Maybe a good coach would take this position and say, no, let's take that pawn off of c6 and now we'll put it on f6. How would you evaluate this position? Well, if you now say, well, you said before the double pawns weren't that bad and black had the bishop pair, therefore black's a lot better. The answer is, well, black's still doing fine here, of course, but now black, white's doing a little better than he was before because now black's doubled pawn is on the side of the board where white only has three pawns, and we call this a crippled majority. And a crippled majority here means that in an endgame with king and pawns against king and pawns, those four pawns against three for black cannot create a passed pawn. On the other hand, with white having four pawns against three pawns here, white can create a passed pawn in the end game. He has a mobile majority, and this is much better than if black had the double pawn on c6. So again, you're getting feedback about this. Now, I got feedback a few years ago. I thought that white would be winning this end game if all the pieces got traded off, but we actually were able to kind of put it into a really strong engine and let it play, and the engine confirmed what I thought was true. So now what I thought was true, now I know is true, that if we talk, take all the pieces off the board, let's do that. And that way, of course, blacks no longer has the advantage of the bishop pair. If we take all these pieces off the board and we play out this end game, let's say it's black's move, then with perfect play, white should be winning. Now, Stockfish probably won't see that at like 20 ply, but if he goes deep enough, he should start seeing that the white's winning. So right now, at 20 ply, he only has white at 1.3, which kind of hints that white's probably winning. But if you let it run overnight, that number's going to keep growing. And white is winning this position with best play. So that's, again, part of my knowledge. And I get feedback from that from the engine, it's true, but at first the feedback I got was some good players telling me this position is really bad for black and white's extra majority is probably going to be winning in the game. While if we put this pawn over here on c6 and play this end game, this is probably a draw. Again, if we give this to Stockfish and we ask him to look deep, he's still around one, but the number is not quite as high as it was before. And notice it's not getting higher, it's actually getting lower, which is what happens as he begins to realize that white can't make progress. So before it started around one and it grew up to about 1.4 within a few seconds. Now it started around one and you can see it's dropped all the way to 0 0.5, 0 0.6 in again a matter of maybe 30 seconds. So that kind of knowledge is very helpful. But again, that's not the kind of knowledge you get from an engine unless you know how to ask it the right questions. But, you know, when you go over games with your friends who are good players, you go over with your opponents, some of your opponents are better than you, some are equal, some are worse. You always want to go over the games with your opponent. Your opponent knows things that nobody else in the world can know. No grandmaster, no engine knows things like, why did he make that move? For instance, at the start of this game, you know, white played b4, e5, bishop b2, knight c6. Only black's going to know why he thought knight c6 was safe with the potential removal of the guard. Now white played a3. Well, we don't know why white thought that b5 was bad. We know that b5 is good. But we're not sure what he was thinking. Why, why did he think that b5 wasn't going to just win the pawn after a few moves? 
<clears throat> only your opponent would know that. So per, part of the feedback that you're trying to get in the, in, in the improvement feedback loop is to get feedback from your opponents. Now, after you go over the games with your opponents, does it make, sure, make, make sense to give it to an engine, to go over with good players? Absolutely. And if you have a friend who's a really good player and he's willing to go over your games with you for free and, you know, help you out. I had people like that when I was getting better. I went to the Germantown Chess Club and Rich Pariso and Jerry Coker and Don Lotso and Rich Lundenfeld, you know, would go over games with me and I would be learning so much. It was like sort of like getting free lessons, you know, as part of being a member of the club, that people in the club would help each other. And, of course, I tried to do that, too, when I go to the Mainline Chess Club and people ask me to go over the game with them, you know, I'm almost always glad to do that unless I um, have to run out the door for something. So, you know, you want to pass it along, pass it forward to do that. You want to help people. And, and as a full-time chess instructor, I want to help people as well. I, you know, when people come to me for lessons, I'm not just doing it because I want to make money. I, I was making more money as a software manager. I want to help people. I, I like helping people and seeing them get better and and answering their questions and solving their helping them solve their problems. When you get this improvement feedback loop, the loop basically says, play a little, study a little, get feedback on what you were studying and what you were playing, and then keep repeating the loop. Study some more, play, try to apply what you studied, go over the game with a good player, with your opponent, with an engine, look it up in a database. <clears throat> Get that loop working really fast. The faster the loop goes around, study, play, get feedback, study, play, get feedback, the better you are. That's why younger players can get better today because it used to be they'd have to wait to ask a grandmaster, you know, what about this line or that line, and now they can ask the engine. So that enhances their loop. It's, it's not that the engine is the only thing in their loop. They still have, a, have you know, good people who are instructing them. Everybody does that gets to be a good player pretty much. But they can enhance that with the databases, the engines, and all the, the wonderful tools that we have today to help you get better. So the faster you go around that loop, the better it is. If you cut out any one thing from that loop, it doesn't work. Let's say you study and get feedback and study and get feedback, but you never play. Well, then you're not going to get experience. You're not going to get practical use for what you're studying. Let's say... You, as I said at the start of the video, if you study and you play and you never get any feedback, then your misconceptions gonna, are going to sit there and you're going to have those misconceptions. Uh, if you're playing too fast or too slow, you've got no one to tell you that. Maybe you're lucky and an opponent will tell you that, but then that's feedback. So you need that feedback if you're just studying and playing. A lot of people think, study, play, study, play, study, play. I get real good. Well, you can improve. Absolutely. No one's, I'm not going to sit here and tell you you can't possibly get any better just by studying and playing, but you're actually trying to get your own minor feedback when you're doing that. But it's much more efficient if you do all three, study, play, get feedback. And I'm not just telling you you have to hire a coach. You could have a, a strong friend. You can have good opponents that help you with things. You do get feedback from the databases and from the engines. You just have to be careful about what kind of feedback you're getting. So this improvement feedback loop is kind of the optimal way to get better. And the more you feed all the aspects of that, for instance, if you play against the right people, instead of playing 10 or 15 minute games again online, if you play like 45, 45 games online or 90, 30 occasionally, and you know, you throw in some fast games just to practice your openings, well, that's going to be a lot, lot better than if you just play a bunch of 10 minute games and never learn how to think. You know, that's part of my feedback loop is to tell you that, okay, 10 and 15 minute games are fun, but learning how to think right in chess is a thinking game. It's just not going to work that well in terms of learning what you should think, how to think, how to find things out really well. Sure, Magnus Carlsen can play a 15-10 game and play fantastic. But look at all the slow games he played when he was young to become a, not only a great player and a grandmaster, but a world champion. You know, I tell people here in Philadelphia, we have the World Open. We have the National Chess Congress. You know, who did I see, you know, 20 years ago playing in these tournaments? It was uh, Hikaru Nakamura and Fabiano Carano coming down from New York, you know, to play in the tournament. So playing in all these slow games is really, really, really important for your improvement. But your whole, you want your whole loop to work. You want to study the right things. You don't want to just try to memorize a bunch of opening books. 
Uh, if you're studying tactics and you're not very good, you don't want to study a lot of intermediate tactics until you master lower le level tactics because lower level tactics are like the multiplication tables. There's no sense in studying what 473 times 1742 is if you don't know what 6 times 7 is. It just doesn't make sense. You want to learn 6 times 7 inside out, upside down, backward and forward. Same thing when you're learning chess. You want to get the basic tactics inside out, upside down, backwards and forwards before you do harder tactics, or at least before you do exclusively harder tactics. So again, this is feedback from a coach that you're getting, but it also is telling you what's the best thing to study. If you're playing in a tournament, what's the best section to play in? If you're playing in a tournament, you're trying to win money, what's the best openings to play? If you're playing in a tournament and you're trying to improve, is it better to play openings that play to your strength, or maybe it's better to learn by playing openings that force you to learn things by playing into the kind of openings, into the kind of positions that maybe you're not very good at. So again, you've got all this kind of things happening in the improvement feedback loop. You have what to study, how to study, where to study, how much to study, where to play, who to play, what time limits to play. You know, just everything's going on. All this kind of things going back and forth between study, play, get feedback. Okay, so today, we've talked about some of the most important issues in getting better at chess. The improvement feedback loop. And you want to be really good at it so that when you're improving your knowledge or you're trying to improve your skills, you're doing it the very best ways you can. If you improve your knowledge, that's great. You have to understand you have to also improve your skills. Improving skills sometimes is more difficult than improving your knowledge. Agreed. But getting help with that, getting feedback with that is going to be very, very helpful. Okay, hopefully you enjoyed today's video. The best thing you can do is tell your friends about my channel, Dan Heisman Chess. If you liked the video, you can hit the like. If you haven't subscribed, we'd love to have you subscribe. And we'll see you next time. Thanks a lot. Bye.